I'm Tom, coming to you from the International Institute for the Advancement of Sourdough Science and Research of Cleveland, Ohio, also known as my kitchen. Thank you for selecting this video. In today's video, we're going to get back to doing some experiments. I haven't done one of these in a while, but I've been busy producing some incredible content. If you haven't seen it, check it out. First, I've created a new website at the sourdoughjourney.com. This has the most sourdough content you'll find anywhere, and I'll continue adding to this as we go. I also published two new videos. One was called How to Read a Sourdough Crumb, where I have a downloadable guide to help you tell if your loaves are overproofed or underproofed that goes with that accompanying video. And then I also published a video called The 10 Secrets of Sourdough Success, which also has a printable guide that you can download to follow along. In that video, The 10 Secrets of Sourdough Success, I talk about one secret is to experiment with different bread flours. So that's actually what we're going to do today. In today's video, we're going to bake six loaves of bread with six types of bread flour that I've never used before. Now, if anybody watching this is in the legal profession, the first rule they teach you is never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I guess that's why I didn't go to law school I have no idea how this is going to work out. This should be fun. So if you look at sourdough recipes or books, the vast majority of them say to start with a thousand grams or so of bread flour. That's if you're in the US. In other parts of the world, this might be called strong flour. But here in today's video, I'm gonna to refer to it as bread flour. So the first question we have to answer is, what the heck is bread flour? Now, I don't consider myself to be an expert in flowers. I haven't done a lot of experimenting with different flowers, so I had to do a lot of research for today's video. So I'm going to talk you through what I learned in this process. It's been fascinating. Now, if we want to understand flour, the first thing you need to understand is wheat. Now, wheat is a type of grass, and at the top of the stalk of wheat, there are wheat berries or wheat kernels. They look like this. But if you took one of those and looked at it up close, there are actually three components to it, and you'll see it in this chart. The outside skin is called the bran, the soft inner part is called the endosperm, and basically the seed inside of there is called the germ. Those are the three components of wheat, and this is important for understanding how flour is made. So a good way to think about a wheat berry or a wheat kernel is as if it were an orange. So now if I peel this, I'll show you the three components of an orange are very similar to the three components of a wheat berry. And here we are. The skin is the bran. This is exactly like a wheat berry. It has an outer shell. And if you imagine this were dried out, this would be very hard, sharp on the edges. That's what a dried wheat berry is like. It's the skin is the bran. Then inside you have this soft fleshy part known as the endosperm. This is the good stuff. And then if you open it up and you imagine that every orange only had one seed in it, the seed is the germ. So the three components, the bran is the skin, the endosperm is the flesh, the germ is the seed. Now, if you think about the components of a wheat kernel based on weight, the endosperm makes up about 84% of the weight of a wheat berry. The bran makes up about 14% of the weight and the germ makes up about 2% of the weight. So it's actually very similar to what we see here. Now the weight and those components are very important to understand how flour is made. Because if I just grind up 100% of the wheat berry and put this in a bag, this is considered whole wheat flour. I'm using 100% of the wheat kernel. If I put 100 pounds or 100 kilos in the mill, I get 100 pounds or 100 kilos out. That's also called 100% extraction, and that extraction rate is important because it means how much is being left behind. In whole wheat or wholemeal flour, nothing's being left behind. All the parts are ground up and they're put in a bag, and that's, what consider, that's what's considered whole wheat or wholemeal flour. But if you think about most white flours, which I'm gonna call refined flours, that means some of this is sifted out. So refined flour is essentially only the endosperm. So we basically grind this up, we put it through a series of sifting sieves or screens, and you take out the bran, you take out the germ, and what's left is just the endosperm 
This is what makes white flour. So now let's go back to those percentages. You would think if I take out my bran, which is 14% of the weight, I take out the germ, which is 2% of the weight, I'd be taking out 16% and I would have 84% of the weight of the original wheat berries left, which should be the endosperm. That would be an 84% extraction, meaning I've extracted flour and I got 84% of the weight of what I started with. What happens though, is as I'm sifting out the bran and the germ, I'm also losing a little bit of the endosperm with it. So what I end up with to get to what's considered refined white flour, you only have 72% of the original starting weight. This number is incredibly important when we start talking about flour. So I have 72% extraction, which means I put 100 pounds or 100 kilos into the mill. I took out 28%, which is a mix of the bran, the germ, and a little bit of the endosperm that goes with it. And I end up with 72% of that weight left, which is all endosperm. That's considered a refined white flour. Remember that number 72%. We're going to come back to that a lot during this video. Now, what else are we losing besides weight when we do that refinement or that sifting of the flour? Take a look at this chart. When you take out the bran, you're losing the fiber. That's really where the fiber and minerals are. When you take out the germ, you're losing some of the nutrients and really you're losing the fat. And the seed or the germ of a wheat berry contains fat and oils. And the reason that was taken out of refined flours is because they wouldn't spoil or go rancid if you took that seed or that germ out. So what's left is the endosperm, which is the starchy carbohydrate with most of the protein in it. So as we start to talk about the flours, we're going to go from wholemeal flour down to refined flours. And this will give you a good image of what you're losing as you're refining the flour. You're losing the bran, you're losing the germ, and you're losing a little bit of the endosperm. So now let's look at this in a chart format. We start with 100% whole wheat. We grind it up. We sift out the bran, the germ. We lose a little bit of endosperm. We end up with 72%, and that's what's considered all-purpose or plain or white flour. You can keep sifting that even more, and it'll become even a more fine flour where you can get down to a 55% extraction rate. And you can imagine as you sift out even the endosperm, you'd lose these little bits and things hanging off the edge of it where you get a super refined flour, but you only have 55% of what you started with. We also talk about what parts of the wheat end up in the flour with whole wheat. You get all of the bran, all of the germ, and all of the endosperm. At 72% extraction, you get mostly endosperm. This would be white flour. And when you get down to 55% pastry flours, cake flours, you're really looking at only endosperm at that point. So now let's talk about protein because protein is an important number that we want to look at when we start evaluating flours. If you take all the components of your wheat berry and grind those up, you're going to end up with about 13% protein. As you start sifting out the bran, the germ, and a little bit of the endosperm, you get down to about 11% protein for what I'd call all-purpose or white flour. And then if you keep sifting more and more of the endosperm out, you get down to about 9% protein for cake flours and pastry flours. And then the last number we need to know about is something called the ash percentage. And I know this is all confusing, but if this wasn't important, I wouldn't be telling you about it. The ash percentage is basically a way to take a bag of flour and in a laboratory to figure out how much of the bran has been removed. Now, the reason you needed a scientific way to determine this is because you can imagine back in the old days when you're milling flour and you're trying to get down to white flour, and you're basically throwing away 28% of what you started with, there's a motivation to maybe cheat on how much of the bran you're actually taking out of the flour. So the ash percentage is a way that you could take any bag of flour in a laboratory, you basically burn it in a kiln, and the amount of ash left at the end of that, when it really burns down to nothing, is basically the remnants of the bran. So this is a way to know exactly how much of the bran has been sifted out of the bread. It's kind of a foolproof indicator of the extraction percentage. So let me put that on the chart now. The ash content of 100% whole wheat is typically 1.4. That means if you kept all the bran in the flour, you'd end up with 1.4% of the weight of the flour as ashes. That's indicating the bran content. When you get down to all-purpose flour, 72%, you have about 0.55% ash because you've taken out the vast majority of the bran. And then when you get down to super refined flour, cake and pastry flour, 55% extraction, 
you have about 0.45% ash remaining in that flower. So all this is is a scientific way to tell you how much of the bran has been taken out and some flower manufacturers will report the ash percentage on their bags of flour. So this is an important statistic to understand. So after all that, we still haven't quite answered the question, what is bread flour? But we're getting a lot closer. Let's look at the chart again. So bread flour is this area south of whole wheat and north of all purpose on the chart. So it's something less than 100% whole wheat because 100% whole wheat would be considered unrefined flour. And once you start sifting out the bran and the germ, you're starting to create a refined flour, which is one of the characteristics of bread flour. And typically the extraction rate will be 72% or higher, meaning it's a white flour or it's a white flour with some bran and germ in it. There's a continuum. And very importantly, we can now focus in on the protein percentage. A lot of people use this range of 11 to 13% as the typical protein percentage for flour. That's a good starting point and a simple definition. And then that ash content that we talked about is typically lower than 1.4%, which would be whole wheat, and higher than 0.55%, which would be all purpose. So now you're thinking this might be getting easier. I can look at all those variables in that range and read a bag of flour and tell if something is bread flour or not. There's one other variable we have to consider first, and that's that different types of wheat have different levels of protein. So you can manipulate that protein content by choosing different types of wheat. So now let's look at that. So when we talk about wheat and its applicability for use as bread flour, we're looking for two characteristics in the wheat. One is the protein content. We want high protein wheat from 11% to 13%. Some wheat will even be higher than 13%. The second thing that we're looking for is the ability for that wheat to create strong gluten. There are two proteins in wheat, glutenin and gliadin, and when those combine with water, that creates gluten. We want gluten, we want a lot of gluten, and we want strong gluten. That's really a characteristic of bread flour. But those two proteins, the ratio of those proteins can differ in different types of wheat. So there are certain species of wheat that have a favorable ratio that creates strong gluten development. There are other types of wheat, wheat that have a weak ratio that creates weak gluten. So a good example is two types of wheat, emmer and einkorn, which both have a high protein percentage but they do not have a favorable ratio of those two proteins for creating strong gluten strands. So those are not considered strong bread flour, even though they meet a lot of the criteria on that chart. So now let's talk about the type of wheat that does create strong gluten. Now, unfortunately, there are not standard naming conventions for all the wheat around the world. So I'm going to use the United States classifications for wheat. As we move forward, when we get into looking at different types of flours, I'll do a comparison to other common types of flours in other parts of the world. In the US, we have three criteria for categorizing wheat. The first one is the hardness. We have hard wheat and soft wheat. Hard wheat is better for bread flour. The second criteria is the color. We have red wheat and white wheat. Red wheat is better for bread flour. And the third criteria is the planting season. In the U.S., we plant wheat in the spring or in the winter. Spring wheat is better for bread flour than winter wheat. So now if we put all those criteria together, you come up with five classifications of flour. Here they are, from going from strongest to weakest. Hard red spring wheat is the strongest and best for bread making. Hard red winter wheat is the second strongest. Hard white wheat, either spring or winter, is third. Soft red winter wheat is fourth and soft white wheat spring or winter is fifth. So this chart shows from strongest to weakest the type of wheat that you want for strong bread flour. So we finally have an answer to the question, what the heck is bread flour? This is not a dictionary definition, this is my definition. Bread flour is a refined wheat flour with 11 to 13% protein or higher, and it has good gluten forming properties. Let's break this down. Refined means that it's not whole wheat. It has gone through some level of extraction, lower than 100% extraction, higher than 72%, and you can determine that scientifically through the ash content or the ash percentage. And if the extraction rate is about 80% or higher, 
and the ash content is about 0.8% or higher, those refined flours are typically called high extraction flours. The second criteria is that it's wheat flour. It's not rye flour, it's not rice flour, it's not a nut flour. We need to have wheat to create strong gluten. 11 to 13% protein is the typical content of protein for bread flour. You'll find bread flours that have higher than 13%, but I would call these high protein bread flours. And then you want good gluten forming properties, which comes from the species of wheat. And we talked about the five classifications of wheat in the US. Hard red spring wheat is best. Hard red winter wheat is second best. So if you take that definition and those few qualifiers, we're going to talk about three types of bread flour in this video. Basic bread flour with 11 to 13% protein and an extraction rate below 80%. High protein bread flour with a protein percentage above 13% and high extraction flour with an extraction rate above 80%. It's possible to have a high extraction and high protein bread flour, but for simplicity, we're going to refer to things as one or the other based on those prior two conditions. Here's a summary of everything we just covered in this section if you want to pause or print a copy of this. And as promised, here's a chart comparing the U.S. types of flowers to flowers in other parts of the world. Here's the lineup. We have eight bags of bread flour. Now, as I said, there's no standard definition of what bread flour is. That's why we had to go through all that detail. This is bread flour. 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 These are all completely different flours and they'll make eight completely different loaves of bread. So that's why we're going to do the experiment today. Now, I have not done a lot of experimenting in the past with different flours because I try to keep all of my recipes consistent across all my videos. So I've primarily used King Arthur bread flour and Central Milling Company high mountain high gluten flour. I have never used any of these flours. I have blended this Central Milling Company Artisan Baker's Craft Plus in with some of my flour, but I've never used that 100% by itself. So six of these eight, I've never made a loaf of bread with. I haven't even opened the bags on five of the eight. So based on everything we learned in the prior section, what can we tell about these different flours? It would be easy if you just pick up a bag of flour and it says, oh, here's the extraction percentage, here's the type of wheat, here's the protein percentage, here's the ash percentage. Very few flours indicate those criteria on them. So you need to do some research. I had to go out to the internet and go to the actual manufacturer of a lot of these flours to try to find some of that detail so we could tell what's in these or how they're milled differently. And even on some of the manufacturer's sites, they don't disclose all those details. Some of them will only give you the protein percentage and that's all. So one of the skills you need to develop as a sourdough baker is to do a little bit of investigative research on the type of flour that you're using and then go back to the charts that I used in the prior section to try to figure out how is this flour going to behave differently based on what I can discern from the labels or from the manufacturer. So now you might be saying, Tom, this is easy. Just look at the nutritional label. At least it'll tell you what the protein percentage is. Maybe if you live outside of the U.S., it does. But in the U.S., our labeling is awful, particularly if you're trying to figure out the protein percentage of flour because our labels are based on 30 gram serving size, not 100 grams. And it tells you the protein percentage in grams, not percents. So this label says four grams of protein in 30 grams of flour. Every bag of flour you pick up off the shelf will either say three grams or four grams because they round to whole numbers. So for this example, where it says there are four grams of protein in 30 grams of flour, do the math first. That four could be rounded up from anything higher than 3.5 grams, and it could be rounded down from anything from 4.49 grams. So that gives you a range of potential protein content in here of 11.6 to 14.9%. That is a ridiculously wide range. I can't do anything with that. If this said three grams of protein per 30 grams of flour, which some lower protein flours will, 
that three could be rounded up from anything north of 2.5 and anything south of 3.49, that would give me a range of protein percent in my flour of 8.3% protein, which would be incredibly low, to 11.6% protein, which would be a strong bread flour. So these labels are completely unreliable. So I've done research on all these eight bags of flour. Let's go through each one and try to figure out what each one of these is and where it fits on our continuum of bread flours. First, Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This is from the Central Milling Company. This is a bread flour with 11.5% protein, which is a little bit low on the range here. You're gonna see some higher ones in the rest of these examples. That ash percentage of 0.6%, that's slightly north of all purpose, which is 0.55. So this means there's a tiny amount more of bran or germ in this flour than you would find in an all-purpose flour. And this flour is malted, which means that barley malt has been added to it, which basically adds a little bit more sugar. It'll give it a little darker color and it'll caramelize the crust a little bit more. Some flours are malted, some are not. Second, Pillsbury Best Bread Flour. This is a supermarket brand in the US. There's very little data out there on this. The only thing I know about it is that it's 12.5% protein. I don't have any other statistics on that. The third one, King Arthur Bread Flour. I use this flour all the time. This is a very consistent supermarket bread flour in the US, 12.7% protein, and this is also malted with barley malt, similar to that central milling company. So let's pause here. So these first three flours are very comparable. These are what I would consider kind of high volume production bread flours, 11 to 12.7% protein. These three would be very comparable just based on what I'm seeing on paper. Moving on, Central Milling Company High Mountain High Gluten Flour. This is a high protein bread flour, 13.5% protein. As I mentioned, anything higher than 13% is generally labeled as high protein bread flour. This has the ash content of 0.6 relative to all purpose, which is 0.55. This means this is a refined flour with slightly more bran or germ in it than you would find in all purpose flour. I've used this flour quite a bit in my experiments. It's a great, consistent, high protein bread flour. Next, we have Karen Springs. This is a miller from the state of Washington. This is their Trail Blazer bread flour. They give a range of protein on the label, 13 to 14.5%. That's a very high protein percentage. And they give the extraction rate of 85%. So if you recall, all-purpose flour is 72%. So that means that we're getting some extra bran or germ in here that's producing some of that high protein. Next, we have Janie's Mill. This is a small mill in Illinois. This is a hard red spring wheat with 13.6% protein, 80% extraction rate, so similar to the Trailblazer that we just saw at 80%. Now they provide the ash percentage here, which is 1.4%. Now if you were paying attention back on that chart, 1.4% is the ash content of whole wheat flour. So this one really jumps out at me because how could this possibly have 1.4% ash content and be a refined bread flour? The reason is because Janie's Mill does stone ground milling. So this is a much coarser grind and it probably does have a lot more bran and germ in it even though it's been filtered or sifted out. So I'm curious to see how this one shapes up because on paper, this reads like a whole wheat flour, but it's called high protein bread flour. And I know that it can't be 100% whole wheat because the extraction rate is 80%. So that means 20% of the bran and germ was filtered out of here, but it still has that very high ash percentage of 1.4. This one's a mystery to me. I'm looking forward to seeing what's in there. So now let's pause because these three flours are all similar. These are high protein bread flours. They all have about 13.5% or higher protein. This one is the outlier with that high ash content, but I would consider these to all be very similar, at least on paper. Next, Central Milling Company Old World Bread Flour. This is a 12.5% bread flour with 0.8 ash content. So this is much higher ash content than all purpose flour. So our whole wheat was 1.4. All purpose was 0.55. So this has a bit more of what you'd consider to be a whole wheat content in it based on that ash percentage of 0.8. And then lastly, we have Janie's Mill Artisan Blend. 
This is 11.2% protein, so a little bit lower protein, actually the lowest of any that we have here. It has a very high extraction rate, 90% extraction. That means it's close to whole wheat, which would be 100% extraction. And that's also evidenced in its ash content, which is 1.3% versus the standard for whole wheat, which is typically 1.4. So this feels like a bread flour that acts and looks more like a whole wheat flour. This is also stone ground as well, which indicates why that ash content is high. Now these last two flours that we talked about are kind of in a class by themselves. These are what are considered to be high extraction flours, 80 to 90% extraction. And again, that extraction rate means how close is this to whole wheat? So these are almost like a bread flour and whole wheat blend based on the extraction rates that we're seeing here. So these two are also called artisan bread flours, old world bread flours, and these are more similar to what you would buy in France if you were buying a bread flour in France. It has a little bit more of the whole wheat content in it. So I've summarized all these on a chart if you want to pause here and look at those details. So now, if you recall, when I said we're doing this experiment, we're baking six loaves, not eight. So what am I doing with eight bags of flour here? I'm gonna disqualify two of these because I've already baked a lot of bread with these. I'm gonna take out my King Arthur bread flour, strong performer, but I've used that a lot in the past. And I'm going to remove the Central Milling Company High Mountain High Gluten flour because I've used that a lot in the past. So what this leaves us is a nice set of two what I'd call bread flours, two high protein bread flours, and two high extraction artisan bread flours. So these are the six bags for the experiment. I put these on this chart. You may even wanna take a picture of this or print it out so you can follow along as we go because I'll be referring to these as loaf number one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I'll try not to be repeating all the detail about the protein content, the ash percentage, et cetera, because I'm going to assume that you're gonna have a record of that to follow along through the rest of the video. Now this is the part in the video where you got through that first part, you look down at the time left on this video and you say, wow, this is gonna be a long one. Stick with me for a minute just so I can explain what I'm gonna do here. So when I create these experimental videos, I'm trying to create scientifically repeatable experiments. So I include all the steps that are germane to the outcome of the experiment. So that if you came back five years from now and say, Tom, what was the difference between loaf one and two? How many stretch and folds did you do? What did your starter look like? How did you prepare the starter? If I leave all that detail out, then this is kind of an interesting experiment, but it's not scientifically repeatable and I can't really validate the results in the future. So I include this long middle section because this is where I'm gonna show you as a baker how the dough smells, how it feels. Does it ferment faster? Does it ferment slower? These are really the skills that you wanna learn, but I realize it's long so if you're impatient, you want to just see the end, then jump to the part that says comparison of loaves. I have the chapters along the bottom. You go to the comparison of loaves and it's kind of as if this part of the video didn't exist and you'll see the answers at the end. Then if you want to come back and see, wow, how did he create this miracle? You can watch this whole middle section at your leisure. But I encourage you to watch it start to finish because I really cover a lot of the nuances here about the baking process that are really lost if you just go to the end. The recipe I'm following today is based on Chad Robertson's basic country loaf from Tartine Bread. I use this in all of my experiments. There are a few minor modifications today. Let me put this up on the screen so you can follow along. First, I'm scaling these down. Instead of doing 500 gram loaves flour weight, I'm doing 330 gram flour weight loaves just to have a little bit more manageable sized loaves. The water content, I've rounded up a little bit from 75 to 76%. So this is slightly higher hydration than what's called for in the recipe. The starter is 20% of the flour weight. The salt is 2% of the flour weight. That gives us a total hydration of 78%, which is a good hydration level, I think, for all these flours. Now, some people might say, I'm going to bump up the hydration on the high protein flours. Just kind of instinctively, you might want to do that. I want to just do a baseline in today's video. I'm going to do them all at 78% because I've never used any of these flours before. I need to see how they behave. And then if this makes sense, I can do a video in the future of four different hydration levels for six bags of flour, which would be 24 loaves of bread. That'd be really interesting. 
but today we're gonna stick with 78% hydration. Then I follow the recipe exactly as you can see here, 30 minute ferment at least, that's flour, water, and starter. Add the salt, do a 30 minute rest, bulk ferment at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius to about a 35% rise in the dough. Now you might think that's a relatively low percent rise. I've done a number of experiments on this and they're really fascinating. If you look at my videos in the when is bulk fermentation done series, there's a video in there where I look at the impact of different temperatures on bulk fermentation rise times. It's fascinating. Because I bulk ferment this at a higher temperature, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius, you have to cut off bulk fermentation a little bit earlier at that 35% rise. Because the dough keeps rapidly fermenting at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius, while you're doing pre-shaping, while you're doing the bench rest, while you're doing the final shaping, and even for the first few hours when it goes into the refrigerator, so when you're bulk fermenting at a high temperature, you gotta hit the brakes a little bit earlier on the percent rise because that dough is gonna really keep rising until it gets down to refrigerator temperature in the cold retard. That's a really fascinating video if you wanna check it out. I'll appreciate bench rest and final shape today. The dough will go into the refrigerator for cold retard and we'll bake all these up tomorrow and see how they look. I have an important announcement to make. I want to introduce a new arrival here at the Institute. This is the Broden Taylor proofing box. A friend of mine came to visit during the summer. I gave her some dehydrated sourdough starter that she took home. I taught her how to make bread through email and text messages and she watched my videos and she started producing fabulous loaves. As a beginner, it was phenomenal and she bought me this proofing box. It's incredible. Thank you so much, Dara. I appreciate it. But this is a new addition to the kitchen here at the Institute. It's fantastic. You set your temperature 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius. I can put six small proofing bowls in here and it'll keep them at perfect temperature. So I'm going to be using this today. So I've measured out the flour from the six bags. Let's take a quick look at these. I don't notice a lot of significant differences here. Here are the two bread flours, Central Milling and Pillsbury, look like typical flour. These are the two high protein bread flours from Karen Springs and Janie's Mill. You can see these have a little bit more of a caramel color to them, especially Janie's Mill on the right. And then these are the two high extraction artisan bread flours, a little bit more color than the bread flours uh, from the supermarket but nothing more to report. Now in all these experiments, I try to document something about my leaven because when I'm trying to control for all the variables in these experiments, the leaven strength is one of those variables that you really can't measure. So I try to show it so we can see it. I'll talk about how I created it. I created this last night, actually 13 and a half hours ago. It was a long leaven build but it's the middle of winter here and I knew that my overnight kitchen temperature would be very cool. It got down to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is maybe 15 degrees Celsius. This is actually sitting at 67 degrees Fahrenheit right now. It hasn't even come up close to room temperature yet. So I built this through a 110-10 feeding last night. So I used 20 grams of starter, 200 grams of flour, 200 grams of water. The flour that I used was a 50-50 mix of Central Milling Company whole wheat flour and Central Milling Company high protein bread flour. I mixed this with cold water to give it a slow start. I let it sit in my cold kitchen. It's just risen about 30% right now, which is good. I am gonna do the float test here. Some people say the float test is unreliable, but if you follow this specific recipe for the leaven build, I find it to be quite reliable and it's another data point that's floating beautifully. This actually looks really good. So I need 66 grams of starter for each one of these loaves. Before I pour this out though, the way that I prepared my starter is I kept my starter in the refrigerator for about a week because I haven't been baking that frequently. I took it out of the refrigerator a day before I planned to bake and I fed it three times that day, early morning, midday, afternoon. So it was just peaking at 10 o'clock last night when I used it for this leaven. It felt really strong. So if I pour out 66 grams of this, That looks really super. That is not too far along at all. It actually looks pretty young. When it's stiff like that, that's a good sign. It smells beautifully 
yeasty. I'm gonna pause the video here for a second. This is Tom from the future with an important update. When I mixed that leaven, I was worried that it was going to be too far along by the time that I mixed it 13 hours later, but I overcompensated with the cold temperature and the cold water and the 110-10 feeding, and this leaven really wasn't up to full strength. You're gonna see later in the video that the bulk fermentation times took longer than expected. This is one of the reasons why, and you can see that leaven is kind of stiff and it only rose 30%. So I mixed up the six batches off camera, flour, water, and starter. The dough is in the proofing chamber right now. There were only two things that were notable. Number one was this first loaf, number one, the central milling. This is relatively low protein flour, 11.5%. This mixed up super wet. At that 78% hydration, this loaf really felt like it was saturated, this dough. On the other end of the spectrum, loaf number four, this is this Janie's Mill high protein uh, bread flour, 13.6% protein, and that ash content of 1.4%, which is almost like whole wheat. This sucked up the water like a sponge. I mean, it almost felt like I wasn't going to be able to sufficiently hydrate this. I'm gonna keep an eye on this after we add the salt and see if I need to add more water. I really wanna to try to keep all these at 78% hydration, but this one was incredibly thirsty. So next we add the salt. So I add seven grams of salt to each batch with 17 grams of reserved water. That's from the 250 total water. I put in 233 with the initial mixing and 17 with the salt. As I mixed in the salt, there were only a few notable things. Number one, Central Milling Company Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This is that low protein flour, 11.5%. It felt real wet, like that 78% hydration is a lot for that flour. Loaves two and three, nothing really to note. Loaf four was the one I was concerned about on the initial mixing, it was so dry. I added in that 17 grams of water, it actually mixed up okay. It's still the thirstiest of all six loaves, but it felt okay when I added the water. And when I say it's thirsty, that's because it's high protein, 13.6% and 1.4% ash, which means there's a lot of bran in there. That bran acts like a sponge. And then loaves number five and six, these are our high extraction flours, which means that it's almost like a mix of bread flour and whole wheat flour. I could feel really the whole wheat in that flour when I was mixing it, it's a little gritty. And then loaf number six, the other stone ground flour from Janie's Mill with that really high ash content, 1.3% means there's a lot of bran in there, but the protein content is lower, 11.2% is actually the lowest protein. So that one actually mixed up fine with the salt. So it's really that combination on loaf number four of the high protein 13.6% plus that high ash content of 1.4% that makes that a super thirsty flour. So for each one of these loaves, I did about a minute of the slap and fold method just to build some cohesion in that dough and mix in the salt. They went back into the proofing chamber. They'll sit there for 30 minutes. When you do that slap and fold method, the only thing I don't like about that is it introduces a lot of room temperature air into the dough and it drops the dough temperature. So we dropped back down to about 75, 76 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 25 degrees Celsius. So I gotta get that dough temperature back up to my target of 80 Fahrenheit or 27 Celsius. I did stretch and folds one and two off camera at 30 minute intervals, just a few minor updates. Loaves one and two, these are our bread flours at 11.5 and 12.5% protein. These still feel a little wet, like that 78% hydration is a little wet for those two flours. The others feel fine. And then that loaf number four, the Janie's Mill high protein bread flour that really sucked up the water, that actually feels okay now. Once I mixed in the salt and gave it a little more water with the salt and got it up to the 78% hydration, I think that's gonna be fine. It's been two and a half hours since I mixed the dough. We're on to stretch and fold number three. Before I do that, I wanna pull a window pane on each one of these batches so I can really get a feel for where we are in terms of gluten development. Now, window pane is a test that you wanna do during bulk fermentation to see if you have sufficient gluten development. I didn't do a huge amount of hand mixing on these loaves, so sometimes it takes a little bit more time in bulk fermentation 
for the gluten to develop. I'm gonna see where we are. So loaf number one, this is our central milling company, Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This dough is really delicate. I mean, that's a super, super window pane. Look at that, you can see daylight through that. It's not tearing. That's, that's a really beautiful window pane, but super, super delicate dough. Number two, this is our Pillsbury bread flour, 12.5% protein. Look at that, look, at, look how much I can stretch that. It's just tearing on the edges a little bit. Let me try that again. That's a good window pane as well. Really nice gluten development. Starting to tear a little bit, but that's a nice stretch. Number three, this is our Karen Springs high protein bread flour. Now this is stiff and rubbery and I feel much more whole wheat granules in here. This has a little bit of a gritty feel to it and it's tearing on the edges. Yeah, see this feels to me like a, a bread flour with a lot of whole wheat in it. That's a nice window pane though. Look at that really super stretch, really translucent. That's a good window pane right there but I can feel the grit in there. That has a, little, a lot of whole wheat content in it. Number four, Janie's Mill. I know this has whole wheat content in it. Really nice stretch there. Tears a little bit when you have the bran in there. The bran acts like little knives, but that's a super, super window pane there as well. Super translucent. I like what I'm seeing there. Number five, Central Milling Old World Bread Flour. This is our first of our high extraction bread flours. Very nice window pane there. Again, that tearing on the edges because of the whole wheat. Super thin, super translucent. That's beautiful dough right there. I love that one. And number six, Janie's Mill number two. This is the Artisan Blend. A little bit lower protein content. This is more extensible than number four. Look at that stretch, how tall. Super, super window pane there. That's gorgeous. Really nice, really nice stretch. Good translucency. So I'm seeing a great window pane on all of these and they're behaving about as you would expect. Very slight differences between these. I'll do the stretch and fold number three and then we'll come back and do number four in 30 minutes. It's been three and a half hours since we mixed the dough. I'm on stretch and fold number four. The Tartine book calls for at least four stretch and folds. You can do as many as five or six if you think you need it. With this small mass of dough, I think four is gonna be enough because we're really getting a, a big bang for the buck when you're folding that small dough over on itself. You're building a lot of layers. So I'm gonna see how this feels. And I also like to let the dough sit as we get later into bulk fermentation. So it's really untouched in the last couple hours. So I'm gonna do, instead of a stretch and fold, a little bit modified process here. Normally, I like to do coil folds for round four or round five if required, but I can't really do coil folds in these small bowls. So I'm gonna do a mid-air coil fold. This is a little bit of acrobatics, and it'll also help you see what this dough looks like and feels like. Loaf number one, Central Milling Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This loaf is still very sticky and wet feeling, difficult to shape. This really hasn't firmed up much at all during the stretch and fold process. Loaf number two, our Pillsbury Bread Flour. Now this loaf feels a little less wet than it did when I initially mixed it, and this one is starting to firm up a little bit more. This has that 1% higher protein than the prior loaf, the Central Milling Artisan Baker's Craft. This, this loaf feels pretty good now. Loaf number three, Karen Springs Trailblazer. This is our highest protein flour. You can really feel it in this dough. That high protein just makes this dough very stiff, very firm, a little difficult to stretch. But it stands up tall in the bowl when I'm done with this folding. Loaf number four, Jenny's Mill. High protein bread flour, 13.6% protein. This is the one that I thought was under hydrated when we initially mixed it. It actually feels okay now. 
And sometimes these flowers with the high bran content will suck up the water initially like a sponge, but then once that bran gets saturated, this actually feels pretty good. It is not feeling dry at all. Loaf number five, Central Milling Old World Bread Flour. This is the first of our two high extraction flours, 12.5% protein. This dough just feels beautiful. It's supple, but it's also firm. Just has a beautiful look and feel to it. It doesn't feel too wet. It doesn't feel too dry. Number six, this is our other Janie's Mill Stone Ground Flour. This is the Artisan Blend, 11.2% protein. That's our lowest protein percentage and our highest extraction rate at 90%. This one also feels supple, extensible. This is a nice feeling dough, but you can feel a little bit more of the density of this dough because of that high extraction rate and high ash content, which means there's more of the whole wheat particles in this dough than any of the others I'm handling. So the dough has been bulk fermenting for four hours. I'm not going to do a fifth stretch and fold. This dough is still really holding its structure from the fourth fold pretty well. I think this had plenty of handling. So what I'm looking for now is a 35% rise in the dough. When I put the dough in the bowls, I mark them with a marker, and then I take this marker off, put it in another bowl, fill it with water to that level to determine what the starting milliliter marker point is, I add 35% to that and mark it again. So I have all these bowls marked with an exact 35% rise line in volume. So I'm just gonna watch these. So now we're just waiting until bulk fermentation is done. A lot of people ask the question, how do you know when bulk fermentation is done? That's a good question. I made eight videos on that topic and I introduced this tool called the Incredible Bulkomatic System. This is a nine criteria test to determine when bulk fermentation is done. So I look at the temperature, I look at the time, I look at the percent rise. In addition to the percent rise, I look for, are there bubbles on the top? Are there bubbles on the side? How does it smell? Can you do a window pane test? What does it look like when you shake the bowl? So there's a number of criteria that I'll use here to determine when bulk fermentation is done. We'll let this go a little bit longer. I'll check back in probably in about an hour. I continued monitoring the dough during bulk fermentation at the five hour, six hour, seven hour, and seven and a half hour mark, and the dough still had not reached the 35% target rise that I was looking for. So at that seven and a half hour mark, I did the evaluation from the bulkomatic system of the nine criteria, and while I was doing the window pane test, I found on loaf number four, Janie's Mill High Protein Bread Flour, you can see in the video here, that I was starting to see some gluten deterioration in that window pane. You can see it tearing. All the other loaves window panes were strong and translucent, but this one looked like it was moving along, even though the percent rise was only 25%. So I pulled loaf number four at the seven and a half hour mark and pre-shaped that, did a 30 minute bench rest and then final shaped it. All the other loaves finished at the eight and a half hour mark Three of them had a 35% rise and two of them had a 40% rise after eight and a half hours of bulk fermentation. This is from the time when I initially mixed the starter, the water, and the flour. The bulk fermentation times were a little longer than expected because I normally bulk ferment at 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. There were three reasons for the slower bulk fermentation time. One, as I pointed out earlier in the video, I used what I'd call a young leaven. It had only risen 30% overnight. It was a very cool night, and I don't think my leaven was at full strength when I added it to the dough. It rose the dough beautifully, but just took longer than expected. The second reason is that my dough temperature never hit my target of 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. The average dough temperature throughout bulk fermentation was 76 degrees Fahrenheit, 24.4 degrees Celsius. And part of the reason for that was because I was using my new proofing box and with six loaves loaded in that box, I realized as it got later in bulk fermentation, I needed to set the target temperature on the proofer much higher than 80 degrees Fahrenheit if I wanted to get the dough temperature up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So the dough never really got to the target temperature. There's nothing wrong with a slower, cooler fermentation. I'm just documenting that here for the record and I recap all the timing of the steps on the right-hand side of this chart.
After bulk fermentation, I pre-shaped all of the loaves. Here's an example of the pre-shaping that I did on loaf number three. This is the Karen Springs high protein flour. You can see that's a stiffer, firm ball of dough. Then after pre-shaping, I let them bench rest for 30 minutes. And then here's the final shaping technique I did for all the loaves. This is an example of loaf number five, the central milling old world flour, where I do a simple trifold and a batard roll up. This dough had a lot of air bubbles in it. I tucked the ends. Lightly dust it with flour. Tighten it up a little bit with the bench knife. And into the proofing basket for an overnight cold retard. All these loaves cold retarded for about 13 to 14 hours. It's the morning of day two. It's time to score and bake the loaves. Now, as I bake the loaves, I'm going to be baking these in two different Dutch ovens. I follow the exact process that's in the tartine recipe. I preheat my oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 260 degrees Celsius with the Dutch ovens in the oven and I leave the lids off. So I really heat the insides of the Dutch oven. When I load the dough into the Dutch oven, I immediately reduce the temperature to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 232 degrees Celsius. Put the lid on. I bake for 20 minutes with the lid on. Then I take the lid off, continuing at that same temperature and I'll monitor it for 15 to 20 minutes. And based on the color and doneness of the crust, these loaves, these 330 gram flour weight loaves will normally bake up in about 35 minutes. Now I'm baking in two ovens and two different Dutch ovens. And I use this infrared thermometer to ensure that my ovens and my Dutch ovens are at exactly the same temperature. I have a very rigorous process for preheating to make sure that I'm getting consistent baking in both the ovens. So the six loaves are all baked and they are out of the oven. Let's take a look at the loaves. First, I just want to thank the farmers who grew the wheat and the millers who made the flour because these look spectacular. And at the beginning of the experiment, I said that I had never used any of these flours before and I wasn't really sure how this was going to work out. And in my scientific unbiased opinion, all I can say is, holy shit, these loaves look amazing. So let's see what we have here. Number one, Central Milling Company Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This is a basic bread flour, 11.5% protein. This is a malted flour. You can see a little bit of color here. And this was also the loaf I was most worried about because it didn't absorb the water very well. And you can see it's actually a little flat. It's sitting down the way that a kind of super hydrated loaf would look, but it has a nice ear on it. That's a nice loaf. The second loaf, Pillsbury bread flour, 12.5% protein. This is also a basic supermarket bread flour. This one really surprised me. I mean, look at the height of that loaf, the ear. I mean, that's really a beautiful loaf, the way that opened up. I couldn't really tell too much about this when I was mixing it, but this really surprised me in a positive way. Loaf number three, Karen Springs Trailblazer high protein flour. This is a 13 plus percent protein flour and 85% extraction. So this has a little bit of the whole wheat particles in it. Look at the size of this. I mean, this is kind of the incredible hulk of these loaves. I mean, it just blew out sideways. This was the stiffest dough when I was handling it and shaping it. And it stood up the tallest in the refrigerator. This just looked like a real kind of hulking loaf and it, and it baked up beautifully. That's kind of a classic high protein loaf, but it has that dark color that you get with the higher extraction percentage because of the whole wheat particles. Loaf number four, this was kind of our outlier during the bulk fermentation process. This was Janie's Mill high protein flour, 13.6% protein, but this one also had 1.4% ash and 80% extraction, which means there's a huge amount of bran and germ in here. This one almost burned. It, it, it baked up completely in 30 minutes. The others took 35. And that's because there's so much sugar in this loaf. 
from that high content of the germ and the bran. And this was also the one that fermented super quickly. We took this out of bulk fermentation an hour before the others, and it only rose 25% instead of 35%, which most of the other loaves hit. So this one moved very quickly, and you'll see that in the fermentation and in the baking when you have a super active flour with a lot of germ and a lot of bran in it and high protein, 13.6% protein. That's got a lot going on. Loaf number five, Central Milling Company Old World Bread Flour. This is, these two are the high extraction flours. This one is 12.5% protein and 80% extraction, which means this has a little bit of the whole wheat in it. This is a gorgeous loaf. I mean, one of the best shaped loaves, just nice shoulders, looking at it this way and this way, a nice ear. I mean, if there's such a thing as love at first sight with bread flour, if you go back and watch the videotape, every time I touched this flour, I said I loved it, and I really love this loaf. There's just something you know right from the beginning. And then lastly, the other high extraction flour, number six, Janie's Mill Artisan Bread Flour. This is 90% extraction and 1.3% ash, so this is almost like a whole wheat loaf, and it kind of looks that way. You can see it sits a little flatter. You don't get as much height out of it. This is relatively low protein at 11.2%. So this one, even though this is classified as a, as a bread flour, it's pushing right up on the edge of 100% whole wheat type of flour. That's a nice rustic loaf. So the point of this experiment was to look at six different types of bread flour to see what impact they have. There's so much here to unpack. Let me do a couple of comparisons. First, loaves one and two, these were our basic bread flours. They baked up differently when you compare them to each other. So loaf number one on my left, this was 11.5% protein. This one is 12.5% protein. Look at the height. I mean, right there, you see the difference in one percentage point of protein. It's really unmistakable. These bulk fermented exactly the same, exactly the same hydration level, same recipe, same handling, same shaping, and one's taller than the other. It's the protein percentage. The second thing that's really interesting and different about these is the color. So the loaf on the left, this was the Central Milling Company Artisan Baker's Craft Plus and the Pillsbury Bread Flour. The one on the left here is darker because of all the six loaves here. This was the one that was malted. So what this means is these were both basically high re highly refined flours, fairly low extraction rate, typical kind of refined white bread flour, but the one that's malted has more sugars in it. It has barley malt. It bakes up more darkly than the non-malted one. That's a great example of one percentage point of protein and the difference in malt. Loaves three and four. So these were our high protein bread flours, and these also both have a fair amount of the whole wheat particles in them. This one here in Springs, 85% extraction. That's a fairly high extraction loaf. And then the Janie's Mill, 80% extraction, but 1.4% ash, a huge amount of whole wheat particles in here. So these are really high protein flours with whole wheat content. Let's take a look at the two of those side by side. So if we compare the protein percentages on these, the one on the left, unfortunately, Karen Springs only gives a range of the protein, 13% to 14.5%, Janie's Mill, 13.6%. The one on the left just looks like, to me, a higher protein flour because, again, of that height. I don't know for certain. And it, and it also has, I presume, a lower ash percentage, which means there's less of the whole wheat in there. When you start to get a lot of the whole wheat particles, particularly the bran, in a loaf, it'll start to make that loaf want to sit down more because it starts to cut the gluten strands every time you handle it. So that's an example of two high-protein loaves with a fair amount of whole wheat content in them. And then the last two, these were our high extraction loaves. So Central Milling Company, 12.5% protein. Janie's Mill, 11.2% protein. Again, look at the difference in the protein percentage. This is basically 1.3% protein higher in the Central Milling loaf, 11.2% here. You, you just see it immediately in these loaves. That protein content really makes the loaves stand up differently with those big rounded shoulders. The other thing that's very different about these two is the extraction uh, percentage. This loaf had 80% extraction. This loaf had 90% extraction. 
90% extraction is getting really close to whole wheat. So again, you see the, the whole wheat content changes the color, the texture, everything about this loaf is looking more like a whole wheat loaf. This one's looking more like a bread flour loaf. That's you really see the, the break point here between 80% extraction and 90% extraction. That's a great example. Here's another comparison. We have two loaves with roughly the same protein content, the Pillsbury loaf number two and the central milling loaf number five. These both have exactly the same, 12.5% protein. Look at that, the height and shape is real similar, but the difference is that the central milling loaf on the right is higher extraction, which means it has more of the whole wheat particles in it. So you get, to, you get a, a much more interesting loaf in terms of the color and the texture. The, you know, this loaf just has a lot more going on because there are different proteins and different enzymes and things in it from the whole wheat particles. This is kind of a basic white flour versus a high extraction flour at exactly the same protein percentage. Let's take a look at the two siblings from Janie's Mill, number four. This is the high protein loaf, number six. This is the high extraction loaf. These both have about the same ash content, 1.4% ash here, 1.3% ash here. That's an indication of the amount of bran that's in the flour. So let's consider those to be equal. The other big difference here though is the protein content. So number four, this is 13.6% protein. This loaf is 11.2% protein. So a real huge difference in the protein content. Not as much of a difference in height, but you can see a difference in the shape. The reason that you don't see really a huge difference on this one is because of that high bran content in here. The bran acts like little knives that cut through the gluten. So even in a high protein loaf, when you have a high extraction level, or a high ash percentage, which indicates the amount of bran, it, it works against, it counteracts the high proteins. So this doesn't quite stand up like a 13.6% protein loaf because of that bran cutting through the gluten strands. So if I had to summarize some of the findings at this point, here are a few. One, is some loaves just can't handle high hydration. Loaf number one was right on the edge at 78% hydration. This has 11.5% protein. It was just barely on the edge. You can see how flat it is. This might be a good flour to blend in with some whole wheat flour or some of these other high protein flours. And I've done that in the past. I blended that with the Central Milling Company High Mountain High Gluten Flour, makes beautiful bread. Number two, Supermarket bread flour appears to make a nice loaf. I mean, this was an incredibly inexpensive bag of flour, this Pillsbury bread flour. That's a really handsome looking loaf right there. Number three, if you want a tall loaf, go for high protein. I mean, we really see it in loaf number two, loaf number three, loaf number five. That protein content just gives the loaves height. You can really see it with the exception of high protein in loaf number four, which also had a very high extraction rate. So there's a lot of bran in here and that counteracts the gluten in the high protein and you don't get the full effect of a high protein flour if it has a high extraction rate or a high ash content. Then when we look at these high extraction loaves, these start to act like a blend of bread flour and whole wheat flour. This is 80% extraction, still looks really beautiful. 90% extraction starts to look like a whole wheat loaf. Those are the findings for now. Let's cut these open and see what the crumb looks like and see how our proofing worked out. Now let's cut the loaves open and take a look at the crumb. What we're looking for is two things. One is to see what the impact of the different types of flour has on the crumb. I'm very interested to see that because I've never baked with any of these flours before. And the second thing is I want to look at how the proofing worked out to see if you need to make any adjustments to your bulk fermentation or final proofing when you use different types of flour. Loaf number one, Central Milling Company, Artisan Baker's Craft Plus, 11.5% protein. That's a really nice crumb. Now that crumb is a little closed 
to me. It's not the kind of classic open crumb that you would see. And this can come with that lower protein content in that loaf. So with the higher protein, you'll get a more open crumb. This one's a little bit tight, but a nicely proofed loaf. Number two, Pillsbury bread flour, 12.5% protein. Now all these loaves, except loaf four, bulk fermented for eight and a half hours. The bulk fermentation temperature was a little lower than normal for me. It was in the mid to high 70s, which is about the mid 20s in Celsius. So let's call it 76 degrees Fahrenheit was probably the average over the duration. And that would be 24.4 degrees Celsius bulk fermentation. These all rose about 35%. That's a gorgeous crumb. I can hardly believe that this is a supermarket flour. This is the least expensive flour of everything that we used here. And that is just a fabulous crumb. That is perfectly proofed, gorgeous loaf. That is really amazing. Good job, Pillsbury. Loaf number three, Karen Springs, high protein bread flour. This is somewhere between 13 and 14 and a half protein. They don't give the indication. And this is 85% extraction, which gets it into that high extraction range, which means there's some whole wheat content in here as well. Wow, look at that. That's really an interesting pattern. Of all the loaves that I've ever baked, I've never gotten that type of crumb pattern. So that just goes to show that the flour really significantly impacts the crumb. I could never have created this crumb pattern with the prior flours that I was using. This is really fascinating. And I think it's that combination of the not just the high protein, but also that um, high extraction level. So there's some bran and some germ in here. It's a little bit of a tighter crumb, a little bit of a closed crumb, but so consistent top to bottom, edge to edge. I mean, that's just a fabulous looking uh, distribution of small to medium holes there. Even got the bunny's eye right in the right spot there. That's really good. Number four, Janie's Mill. This loaf was my nemesis right from the start. It mixed up super dry. It bulk fermented quickly. It didn't show the rise very well. It got very loose. I shaped it, took it out of bulk fermentation early, baked it up. It baked early. It finished in 30 minutes. It almost burned. Um, so this, this was a, a challenging loaf, having never worked with this flour before. That's a nice crumb. It's another, what I'd call kind of a closed cell crumb, but really fully proof top to bottom and edge to edge. It's really interesting. I like that what, what I'm seeing here with these high protein, higher extraction loaves where you have some of the whole wheat content in there. It's an interesting mix. I have not seen that before in loaves that I've baked. And you can also see the color. I mean, how dark this loaf is on the inside. It's starting to look more like a whole wheat loaf than a bread flour loaf. Loaf number five, like I said, I had a love affair with this loaf from the minute I mixed the flour. I don't know why. Just loved the way this dough felt throughout the whole process. This is Central Milling Company, Old World Bread Flour, 12.5% protein, 80% extraction. So this is a high extraction loaf. Superb. Love that crumb. So this is a little bit more open than the other ones we saw because it doesn't have as much of the bran and German here. 80% extraction uh, and a lower ash percentage, which isn't listed on here. But the, the prior ones we saw had either higher extraction and or higher ash content. That's a gorgeous crumb right there. Love that. Small, medium, large holes. Perfectly proof, top to bottom, edge to edge. Really nice loaf. Last but not least, number six, Janie's Mill Artisan Bread Flour. Lower protein percentage at 11.2%. Highest extraction percentage of any loaf we've dealt with here at 90%, which means it's almost approaching whole wheat. It almost looks like a whole, whole wheat loaf. Gorgeous. Another spectacular crumb, really beautifully proofed loaf. And even with that, that high extraction rate of 90% and 1.3 ash, this is almost a whole wheat loaf. But that baked up more like a blend of bread flour and whole wheat, which is the point of the high extraction loaves. That's another really, really nice crumb.
So now let's look at the proofing level of these loaves. Here's a close-up of each of the loaves so you can inspect the crumb. And what I'm looking for is any indication of over or under proofing. And I'm a pretty harsh self-critic of proofing levels, and I really don't see any indications of overproofing or underproofing here. I'm a little surprised. If anything, these are right pushing up to the edge of where they would turn the corner to overproofing, but sometimes that's where the best loaves occur. And the reason I say that is because when you look at the distribution of holes, look how it goes top to bottom and edge to edge on every one of these loaves. I mean, that is really an indication of a fully, fully proofed loaf. And the cell size is trending towards small to medium versus large. But I believe that some of that is due to the types of flour that we used as well. And at this point in these experimental videos, I usually say, but the bisection doesn't tell the whole story. And then I cut these all up into slices to see if we can see any more evidence of proofing. But I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead here. I can tell just by looking at these that these are fairly consistent throughout these loaves. And we're not, we're not getting any false indications here in the bisection. I also wanna give some of the, these away as gifts, so I'd prefer not to slice them all. But just based on how these look, incredibly consistent crumb. I really expected when you used different types of flours that the fermentation process would really behave differently. And I really saw incredibly little evidence of that. The only thing I can say is that the higher protein flours tend to stand up a little bit more in the proofing bowl. So they'll show their rise a little more evidently than some of the lower protein flours that wanna sit down flat in the bowl. So if you're doing fine measurements of percent rise like I do, trying to measure the difference between a 30% rise and a 35% rise, you have to take into account that protein content because the low protein loaves are just gonna sit a little flatter. And the last point related to proofing is on loaves four and six. These were the real high ash content stone ground loaves. And I think it's really that stone ground method that just makes these more active in terms of fermentation. You could see it right away. And these just take practice to work with. I also think these flours might be better if you blend these in with some other flours. Using these as 100% to make these loaves, you're probably not getting really the full benefit that you would get by using this as an accent flour with a nice bread flour. So I've tasted all six loaves as part of a taste test, but I'm somewhat biased because I know the background of all six loaves. So I enlisted the help of an independent judge. That would be my wife. She is in a hermetically sealed room. She has no idea what loaves I've been baking out here. And I gave her six numbered samples on a tray for her to taste. We then compared our notes and I'll give you the short version of what our summary is, and then I have a detailed page that'll follow this with all the details. Number one, Central Milling Company, the Artisan Baker's Craft Plus. This is a really light flavor with a nice crispy crust, a little bit of wheat flavor, a little bit of sourness, but not a really powerful flavor. This is really the foundation to maybe add something to. So I would say the Artisan Baker's Craft Plus would be something that you would wanna combine with some of these other flours that have a little bit more flavor. Number two, the Pillsbury bread flour. This is a really clean, light flavor. There's not a whole lot of pronounced tones coming out of this, and there's a little bit of an off aftertaste with this, but this is kind of a very basic white loaf. It does not really have a pronounced sour flavor or wheat flavor. Number three, the Karen Springs high protein flour. This is where the texture of the crumb really changed and we started to get more of that firm texture that you get with high protein loaves. So the texture was noticeable on this one and the flavor also started to have more of a wheat forward flavor because this is a high extraction flour. Number four, Janie's Mill high protein flour. This is the one that baked up super dark. This one brought out real caramelized flavor a very wheat forward flavor and a nice textured crumb similar to loaf number three. Loaf number five, the Central Milling Company. This one was my favorite all around. It, we, this is a very light textured loaf, but it has all the pronounced flavors of wheat forwardness 
the sourness. It's just a super loaf that's complex in its flavor, but light in its texture. And number six, Janie's Mill Artisan Bread Flour. This was really a surprise because this loaf looked like a whole wheat loaf, the way that it baked up. So when I bit into this, I was expecting to have that dense, gritty, kind of whole wheat loaf texture, but this actually had a super soft, light texture, but it had that really wheat forward flavor that you would see in a whole wheat loaf. So this one was really a surprise and really good. Here's more detail about the crust, the crumb, and the flavor of all six loaves. So the bottom line is these flowers are all winners. I would use any of these flowers again. I might blend a few of these with bread flour in some cases, but these all baked up fabulously. I'm really impressed with what I've seen here from all these different mills and manufacturers. So when I reflect on this experiment going way back to the beginning, the reason I did this is because in my video, The 10 Secrets of Sourdough Success, I recommend to develop your skills as a baker, you should experiment with different bread flours. So I had to practice what I preach. I did it and wow, I learned a lot in the last few days. I hope you did as well. And you really have to experiment with different bread flours because it opens up a whole world of what's available. If you had just started baking sourdough bread and you sent your spouse out to the grocery store and said, go buy me a bag of bread flour, I wanna make sourdough bread, they could have come back with any of these six bags of flour. These are all listed as bread flour on the label. These are completely different flours. They make completely different loaves and they're all bread flour. So don't get stuck in a rut of just using one type of flour. There's so much more out there and it totally changes the nature of the loaf. And then as you start to work with different ones, you can create your own blends and get a combination or a hybrid of something you like in loaf number one combined with something that you liked in loaf number four. That's really the art of sourdough baking. Thanks for sticking with me on this long video. Good luck on your sourdough journey.